Hi, you're listening to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast, hosted by the Fairwinds Crew. Today we are interviewing Arnie Gunderson. He's ringing in from Japan, where he's on a one-month speaking tour near Fukushima Daiichi, the site of the meltdown. Arnie? So today I went to a resettlement community, and there were uh, 22 women uh, who met us. Uh, out of uh, 66 families that live in this uh, resettlement community, and uh, it was they they stood up and they said, "My name is, and I'm in 6A. My name is, and I'm in 11B." And that's how they define themselves is where they, you know, the little cubicle that they lived in. It was very sad, and they had their um, unofficial mayor the the. the woman who sort of runs all the groups and uh, she was very nice and and uh, she told us that uh, after the disaster at Fukushima her hair fell out she got a bloody nose and uh, her body was speckled with uh, hives and, uh, and boils and the doctor told her it was stress and she believes them it was absolutely amazing and we explained that those are all symptoms of, of radiation and uh, uh, she should have it looked into, and she really felt like her doctor had her best interest in heart, and she was not going to pursue it. So they told us that we were the first people in five years to come to them and talk to them about radiation. They had nobody in five years of, of their exile had ever talked to them about uh, radiation before, which um, was another terribly sad, uh, sad moment. So I asked them, I said, who do you trust? And they said, well, we get a letter from TEPCO once a month, Tokyo Electric Power Company, and um, we read the local newspaper, and that's how we get our information. And we really don't have a choice who to trust, because that's their, our, our only sources of information. So they are, um, you know, they're isolated. They live uh, as this group of 66, and they're insular they don't try to seek out other other sources of material so it was pretty amazing so we asked them um, what it was like did they feel isolated from the rest of japan and they said some of them have changed their license plates so they're not in fukushima anymore uh, so that their license plates show they're from a, another location but when they drive back into fukushima and people realize that they're natives people deliberately scratch their cars deliberately scratch their cars because they're sort of traitors. And then we had the opposite hold true, that people didn't change their plates, and when they left Fukushima and went to other areas, people deliberately scratched their cars because they were from Fukushima. It was really sad. They said, you know, it's a, it's a small minority of people, but it keeps you constantly on your toes about uh, who you can trust and, and it, this animosity toward you as if you're the person that caused the nuclear accident. The, the public's animosity is di directed toward the people that, from Fukushima Prefecture as if they somehow caused the nuclear disaster. Isn't it true, Arnie, that it, after World War II, the survivors of the bombing at Nagasaki and Hiroshima were taunted a lot, and also many of them ha had to not tell their stories or say they had been at either Nagasaki or Hiroshima? because they were the untouchable. We have one with us. We have a 76-year-old man who was uh, six years old when the bomb was dropped. And he talked eloquently today about the people who tried to hide their identities, the problems that they encountered, because when they hid their identities, they couldn't get the medical services that they needed for the injuries they had experienced from the bomb. But then if they told everyone they were from Nagasaki or, or Hiroshima, they were ostracized in the community, so they had uh, they had no friends, and they were laughed at, and things like that. So it was a sort of damned if they do and damned if they don't. There was uh, no safe place to be. Now, he's um, 76 and spoke to the women about his experience, and they were very grateful to hear that they're not alone with the stigma of being exposed to radiation. That when he was a little boy, and he left the area around uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. His friends used to call him Godzilla. He was a monster that was created by this nuclear disaster. So 
Yeah, the stigma started 70 years ago, continues even now at the Fukushima Daiichi. So he's lived a pretty long, full life. To your knowledge, has he had any major health issues, or um, did he have a lot of treatment as a child? I know that some of the survivors had really a different healthy diet, not Western diet, and were especially treated with vitamins and things, and that seemed to help them recover better. Do you know any of that? They told me that for the first five years after the bomb, he was uh, a medical wreck. He, he was emaciated and lots and lots of medical problems, which over time he overcame. And uh, by the time he was 20, he uh, he became an Olympic bicyclist. He he was affected by the bomb and, and through good food and good medicine was able to recover and has lived a full life. So he's a pretty special human being, wonderful man. Well, how did that reconcile with the cancers, the long-term health illnesses, and the disabilities that come from radiation exposure, and the people who claim that hormesis and being around radiation is good for you? The hormesis theory is, uh, there's no foundation in science to support it, and uh, the National Academy of Sciences would say that hormesis is uh, not founded in fact, but in wishful thinking by nuclear proponents. It's like smoking. Some people smoke and and live a full life, and some people smoke and get lung cancer. And and he's one of the lucky ones. He's uh, 76 and doesn't have cancer, and is uh, is active and vital. So it's very much a uh, an individual lucky uh, situation. He was not at ground zero, but he was near enough to. Uh, to be you know, contaminated and experience the disaster. So you know, most of the people at Ground Zero were obliterated you know, in a flash. So he's a special man. One of the things that you've talked about and Marco has talked about is internal radiation exposures and hot particles. What's the difference between a bomb exploding and a nuclear plant exploding and hot particles? Most of the bomb uh, exposure was from a direct flash that was over in seconds. There wasn't a significant amount of contamination on the ground because the bomb went off a thousand feet in the air. So there was not a lot of the radiation residual left on the ground for hot particles to get into people's lungs. There were, were people downwind that breathed in hot particles from the thunderstorms that it created, things like that. But You mean in fallout? Yes, in fallout, downwind from the Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And they, they experienced something called the black rain, and dust particles did come down hundreds of miles away. And so those people are also uh, exposed. But he was at very near ground zero, so his exposure was a flash of external radiation, not a lot of internal radiation to damage organs. And that's not what we're seeing in Fukushima Daiichi. Everything I'm finding here is uh, millions and billions of very, very small particles that are spread pretty much everywhere. We'll know a little bit more about that in the future. I appreciate you answering the question. I've been wondering about it because, you know, you had um, your best-selling book in Japan, and a lot of the pro nukes and the hormesis people proceeded to, to try and refute a lot of what you said before the book was published. I mean, the published book is irrefutable and an important documentary, but they tried to refute anything you said on, on TV or CNN or, or any of the stations in the media that they've tried to refute anything you said because they were trying to claim everything is okay in Japan. Look how well most of the Japanese recovered from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and so therefore it's okay. Don't look this way. There's nothing here to see. Yeah, there's no comparison between a bomb and what happened to Fukushima. The, the bomb obliterated maybe a pound of uranium, and it was a 1,000 feet in the air, so most of it went up almost immediately, whereas uh, each of the nuclear reactors at, at Fukushima had 100 tons of, uh, of uranium in them, so that the uh, quantity of radiation that's uh, spread out throughout the countryside is uh, orders of magnitude higher th uh, at Fukushima than it was at, uh, at Nagasaki. Thank you. I, I needed, I, I know that our followers and listeners would want to hear this. You know, we had another Thing that amazed me was the, uh, the the way the Japanese are paying off the victims is uh, creating a lot of animosity. Th this this community is special because they all came from the same couple of blocks, 
and they are young. They, they all knew each other for many, many years. What's the difference between the people that you met today and other people around Fukushima Prefecture who have been impacted, or you know, going back to those people who were survivors of Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Well, the big difference, the, the community I visited today was special in that there was no animosity between the, the different members. You know, the 22 women, some, some were uh, in their 60s and one was 17. One of them had their parent with them when they lived in, in, in their home community. Uh, she was, uh, the parent was 88 years old, so this is uh, an older woman who was in fine health. Th this community was special. It, it, all, all 22 women knew each other for a long, a long time. Uh, some were in their 60s, and one was as young as 17. And one of the women in her 60s uh, was living with her 88-year-old mother when the uh, disaster occurred. So, and the 88-year-old mother was in fine health and, and loved her community. And um, when they moved her, her uh, she she fell apart, her, her uh, and, and died very quickly because she wasn't in the environment she was used to. And she's actually listed as one of the fatalities now. There's over a thousand people who the Japanese say you know died as a result of the uh, the, the nuclear disaster. So she's one of those people. The twenty, uh, the seventeen-year-old is not allowed to go back in. The Japanese don't let women under eighteen back in. So we asked her, "When you turn eighteen, will you go back?" And she will say, "I will." She said, "I will go back once to pay my respects, and I will never go back again." But the older women had a uh, had a different attitude. You know, it was the the home of their children, and it was their and their ancestors are all there. You know, the family the family ancestral burial grounds are all there, and they have to take care of their ancestors so that they desperately want to go back. We had one woman who cannot go back. She, she's she been told that her house is an area is so contaminated she will never go back. And then we had other women who were been told they had, might have to wait three or four or five more years, but they probably will go back. And then we had a few that uh, thought they might go back in a year or two. Now what the Japanese government does is uh, when you never can go back, they give you a lump sum of money which allows you to buy a house and in some communities there's a lot of animosity because these people can now have a house and they don't have to live in these uh, resettlement situations and uh, the other people who may go back in five years are not given any money and they're kept in these uh, resettlement communities and in limbo until their their homes are ready one of the women lost her house in the tsunami but the ground around it was so contaminated that she could never build there so what the Japanese government did was they paid her for the foundation. Oh, but that's said, horrible. Oh. That's horrible. So she got nothing for the house that was destroyed. She got a small amount of money for the foundation of the house, which can never be built on because it's too radioactive. And she's essentially stuck in this resettlement home uh, for life. So, it, it, yeah, you're right. It, it's horrible. Now, in some communities, these tensions manifest themselves in all sorts of internal hatred. And it, but this community seemed to overcome it. There was a, a wonderful woman from Rwanda who uh, escaped the Rwandan genocide because she spoke Japanese and they got resettled in Fukushima and then had to flee Fukushima. But she seemed to be the, uh, the spark plug to keep people happy and glad that they had each other. Some of the communities don't have that and, and they fall into a lot of infighting of so-and-so's getting more money from the state than I am. So when they leave, they get their cars scratched, and when they hang out together, there's a lot of a lot of animosity over their their payments from Tokyo Electric. So, being a refugee from Fukushima Daiichi is a terrible place to be. I think back to um, Dante, and I think back to Purgatory. You know, limbo. Being in limbo is Purgatory, and just a hellacious place to be. And it's, to my way of thinking, it's so incongruous with how I see Japan. You know, yes, there's intense city living in Tokyo and some of the big cities and everyone's very close together, but there are many parks and, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on beauty and I have pictures that that you and our daughter Alita took when, when you were in Tokyo, just going down a city street and 
and you, you come to a place and, and there's a shrine and there's flowing water and there's plants and gardens so that people can get away and reconnect with nature. And I look at these pictures that you sent of, of where you went yesterday in the resettlement uh, village and there's no feeling of permanency, there's no feeling to put the artistic and spiritual beauty back in the environment that I have always internalized as being Japanese. When we left, they sang a song to us. One of them is an accomplished musician, and, and she wrote a beautiful song about their hometown. And they sang it. It was about three or four minutes long. And it was haunting. It was so beautiful. And they talked about how nice the town was and all the special things in the town and how, how sad they felt to leave it. And that was the only time I saw them cry. Every one of them broke into tears at the end of the at the end of the song. You know the scars are deep. They seem to be focused their lives together, and uh, that's more important than where they live and, and how they live. Is that they're all together? Uh, it's a uh, uh, it was very special, but but terribly sad. And after that, we went to see a family that uh, was in the lumber business and their hillside that they take the lumber from is so contaminated they can't use it anymore. So they have to actually import lumber from around the country. So we asked the, the, the family, what's changed for you uh, since the disaster? And their answer was swift. That everything has changed. Nothing is as it was. And then they went and they used to go up into the woods to, uh, you know, to not just to harvest their, their livelihood, the wood, but they... They, they used the, the fruits and vegetables and mushrooms and things like that that were up in the forest to live on. And uh, they can't get any of that. They can't eat the shiitake mushrooms. They can't eat the fruits that are, that are up there. They can't use the ferns, the salad. There's absolutely nothing in their life that hasn't been torn out from under them. The personal toll... Uh, they, they can't quantify it. There's no, there's no way to put a dollar figure on on, on any of this. There's, you know, 160,000 people that are each individually experiencing this. And you had it right. I think I used the word it was limbo. I said these people are in the, that that place. It's not heaven, not hell, and they they just are in some sort of a holding pattern in their lives. And it was it was terribly sad to see uh, the destructive force that uh, Adam can be. All these women were in their 60s, and, and they said that they would go back because they know they'll probably die of something before they die of cancer. But their kids have already moved on, and their kids won't be back in the village of their uh, that they grew up in. Uh, and their kids won't be back to take care of the ancestors. And then their grandkids are, are not allowed back now, and by the time they get to 18 years old, they will have forgotten the village. So... The, the keepers of the village tradition are all 50, 60, 70 years old. And when they die, their kids are not going to keep that village alive. So it's very much a, a death sentence uh, for, the, for the villages, a slow death. Uh, if they get back into them, there will be no generations to come. What touched me is, by village, you mean their community, their sense, their entire community that had generations of tradition, and that is totally fragmented, and that's for, true for thousands of people. Yeah, there's 160,000 people living in temporary housing, and 60 now have been uh, displaced back into high radiation areas, uh, but another 100,000 are still waiting to get pushed off and into uh, high radiation areas that I don't believe they should be going back to. That's a lot of people. Now that's a, that's the size of a, well, now it's the size of a big piece of the state of Fukushima. Um, and their lives are permanently torn asunder. The other thing that you said that really concerned me and upset me, women are so much more radiologically sensitive than men. These children are, are not to go, allowed to go back until they're 18, but when they're 18, they can go back. And for women and 18-year-olds, um, that's when your reproductive organs are still really, really vulnerable. And, and you would go back, and if you were exposed and you were going to start a family, that's a really tragic amount of exposure for someone that age, don't you think? Yeah, you know, you, you little girls are 20 times more radio sensitive than uh, older adults like me. 
Um, and uh, little boys are 10 times more radio sensitive. And by the time they hit 20 years old, they're still girls three or four times more radio sensitive and, and uh, young men about twice as radio sensitive as older adults. So, yeah, when you send uh, a young family back, if they go back, and most are refusing to go back. They're moving on and lying about their location where they came from. But if they go back, they know that the likelihood of a cancer is dramatically higher than it would have been. It's so tragic. Marnie, thank you for sharing this information with our followers. And I really appreciate it. Have a good sleep tonight. You're 14 hours ahead of us in Japan. And have a good trip tomorrow. I know you're on the road again and uh, traveling. So thank you. To our listeners, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today and hearing Arnie's interview with me from Japan. Join us again next time when we speak to him on the road in Series 4. Thank you. Thank you.